Hi, this is Ash Whitener. And this is Justin Blinko. And welcome to Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create your lifestyle of independence and flexibility. On January 21st and 22nd, we attended the North American Bitcoin Conference. We left with a number of amazing interviews, and we're excited to share one of them with you today. Please help us out by following us on Twitter at Liberty E Podcast and Facebook slash Liberty Entrepreneurs. Also, it would be great if you could subscribe and rate us on iTunes. There will be a link in the show notes and on our website. Today, we are joined by Paul Snow, CEO and Chief Architect of Factum. Factum is a distributed, decentralized protocol running on top of the Bitcoin blockchain, which provides an unalterable record-keeping system for time-stamped, provable document storage and verification. Paul, thank you so much for joining us today. It's good to be here. So, Paul, give us a brief overview of what Factum is and what problem it solves. Well, Factum is a system for uh, creating a general purpose data layer uh, to go over the Bitcoin blockchain. And the idea is no matter what your data is, um, if you would like to have it secured by Bitcoin, so there is a cryptographic hash of your data at that point in time, you can use Factum and Factum will do it for you. Okay, so tell us what a general purpose data layer is, Paul. <laughs> oh, so you want actual specifics and definitions. Okay. Well, um, for, take, take a, a, a number of use cases. Uh, suppose you have a shipping container and you would like to track where that shipping container went and what was placed inside of it. You could create a chain, a particular chain with the serial number of that shipping container, and you could... At each port, and each time you essentially open up the container and put data, uh, put uh, materials into the container or took them out, you could log that in that chain. Uh, a typical chain might go through uh, 10 or so uh, inspections in the course of shipping it from one country to another. And, um, you, you know, basically Factum would allow you to create a chain and put those 10 entries in there. And how is this being handled right now? Um, it isn't really very well. Uh, there are a lot of central, centralized systems, but every uh, jurisdiction has their own systems, and the systems don't always communicate well. And so you have this problem that you don't know the origin of uh, materials that go into f uh, medicines, uh, materials that go into products and food. And we've, we've already seen where uh, a lack of control of where you're getting your raw materials can result in uh, dangerous products. All right. So basically, this is a way to create transparency and accountability for the ingredients or for w whatever makes up an end product. So you can chase this all the way down the line and have it provable. I, I remember I, I was talking to a friend of mine in Denver, Colorado, and as we all know, marijuana is legal in Colorado. But one of the issues that they're having is there's not a lot of transparency about where, where the quality of the product comes from and what goes into the edibles. You know, is this is this kind of a similar uh, similar thing? Um, it might be. I mean, please uh, understand, I am not a subject matter expert when it comes to shipping containers and uh, uh, production of products and whatnot. But as I understand it, the problem is that and more. It, it's m managing what goes into uh, these containers. It's managing the proper inspections, managing the proper uh, assigning priority to these containers, as well as tracking you know, where items came from and, and where they're going. So I, I believe that the problem encompasses a lot of that stuff. Yeah, so how does this deal with like legal documents or, or other important documents or contracts or something like that that people want to put in the blockchain so they can keep it and, you know, be able to point to it and be like, yes, that, that's my document. It was signed or identified or whatever in, in that block right there. Or this is where you can find it. How can Factum help that? Well, that's a very good point. Uh, let's say there's a contract between you and I, 
and we go to court over some disagreement and you have a version of your contract and I have a version of my contract, well, you know, you and I can argue, argue and bicker and pro hopefully we can figure out which one is the right contract. And if you, we had been logging uh, a hash of these contracts into the blockchain, we might be able to determine that, of course, my version of the contract was the right one because, I mean, it was mine after all, and yours was wrong because, of course, you're wrong. Uh, but what if it was a will? And in which case, I'm dead, so I'm not there to argue and defend. And so having a mechanism that allows you to create a chain of um, proofs allows you to prove what is the latest and greatest version of a document. And thus, even if you are dead and, and gone, uh, the latest copy of that contract or the latest copy of that will can be cryptographically proven. It's all about proving the negative. It's not just proving that something exists. It's also proving there isn't something else that supersedes uh, what you have. And factum, factum addresses that problem. Now you're starting to sound like a philosopher as well. How do we prove existence? So can we not already do this using the Bitcoin blockchain? How does Factum add to the already existing functionality of the Bitcoin blockchain itself? Oh, well, that's an interesting question. I mean, certainly you can do anything on the Bitcoin blockchain that you can do in Factum. Um, that, that, that was never in question. But the problem with the Bitcoin blockchain is that it at this point has a limit of one meg. And so there's only so many transactions that you can place into the Bitcoin blockchain. If I were to look at the number of shipping containers that are moving into the United States ports and out of the ports per year, uh, that would be somewhere in the order of 800 million containers or something. I mean, it's some crazy large number. And one of my buddies calculated the number of transactions per second. Well, you know, it'd be about 150 transactions per second for just that application. Bitcoin clearly can't handle that many transactions. And this is just arbitrary data. So these are fluffy compared to Bitcoin transactions. They're big. So an architecture like Factum allows you to take the same security Bitcoin has securing its transaction and scale it even um, over, you know, terabytes of data per year. So after Factum becomes the de facto database for storing proof of data, can we do away with scribbling our name on a piece of paper as proof of agreement to a contract? Do you think there's a world where that might exist? Well, I, I, I think that that world will exist at some point. I, I, it, it, this is essentially getting to the idea of what is an identity and what is authorization and what constitutes authorization. And um, there's a company here, uh, Auth, uh, Auth, I think, Authy, Authy, and they do two-factor authentication. This is the recognition that just one authentication, like a signature, should never really be the, enough on a, a, a very important document. It should also be accompanied with something else so as to prevent uh, forgeries and, and, and fraud. Digital identities and digital authentication holds the promise of much greater security and much greater responsible, holding people responsible for fraud and for malfeasance and where that is going to be adopted first in the world, more than likely you're going to see uh, technology leapfrogging. Uh, you're probably familiar with technology leapfrogging, right? Heard of it, yeah. yeah. The idea is cellular phones were extended much quicker and much faster in Africa and in uh, some other developing countries because they did not have the money to, um, to lay down copper. So you founded Factum. How did you get the idea for Factum? I mean, what were you getting tired of the inability to actually store these types of documents or this transparency? Were you, were you unhappy with the, the lack of uh, utility of the Bitcoin network? Or like, w walk us through your mindset as an entrepreneur thinking about, man, th there's this pain that I see. How can I solve it? Um, yeah, what, what I was doing is I was walking through a number of projects that I wanted to, do, to build. 
Um, one of the ideas is to build a system by which I can authenticate and verify the validity of, of drivers and applications for a computer system. And part of that would also be to automatically inherit the proper um, configuration settings for a system. Of course, that's way complex. That's a lot of data, and, and that's a lot of chains. And, and it also presumes something. I, I need to know the identity of the publishers of such software, and I would need to know the identity of the individual configuring a system. But I also need to know the identity of the system itself and what its role should be a business or at home or whatever. In other words, you might install software on your own computer to do work, but you might also have a system for entertainment and you might have a system for your child. Those would have different configurations because they serve different purposes. So I needed to create digital identities, not just for individuals, but also for systems and for contexts. And so I started working on distributed identity. And then when I started looking at distributed identity, I realized I needed uh, uh, proof of the negative, make sure that no one has updated an identity, uh, track attributes assigned to an entity from external sources. Like, for, in for example, uh, do you realize most of the a your attributes, most of the attributes that identify you as an individual are not yours. They're not attributes that are inherent to you. They're inherent. They're attributes that have been assigned to you. For example, you have a certain citizenship. Well, that came from the country that you're in. You might have a certain membership in a church. Well, that comes from that organization. You might have a degree that was assigned to you from some university, perhaps. You might have a certification for a rocketry. That could be a combination of the state as well as some authorized organizations under uh, operating within some context. And, and I can go on. Um, most of our attributes, most of what of the things that we think define us aren't actually attributes that are ours, but attributes that that have been assigned to us or that we have earned from some other organization. So it's it's a identity is a very very tough problem. Where do you see Factum being used to you to allow us to use identity that we own and we have ourselves assigned? Maybe you know DNA of some sort or or something more personal rather than. You know, a third party giving us a certificate or a social security number or something like that. There's a, uh, a medical company that already has the copyright or, or uh, patent to our DNA. I think they've already purchased that. So <laughs> DNA is too late. Well, that, you, you guys, I'm, I'm a mutant, so I'm, 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 my, I have my own unique DNA. No, um, uh, they, 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 this is a, a very, very philosophical and touchy problem. Because uh, what I what I see factum enabling is is working at a very very primitive low level uh, of digital identity that allows you to establish that an identity was was created at a certain time and 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 a few small aspects like what digital signatures um, should that identity use and maybe even a hierarchy of digital signatures that allow you to essentially back up your identity in a safety deposit box, and you only break out the high-priority signatures if your identity is compromised so that you can repair it and reclaim it um, uh, by signing with uh, messages with higher priority. Um, the idea is start there. And, and then with, build on top of those identities, for instance, a identity within Factum so that you can use that identity to run a federated server and then use that identity to assign uh, software and assign uh, commits to the source code and, you know, just goes on from there. All right, Paul, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it back for a minute. I have experience with developers. Uh, I have an engineering background and it's very rare that you find one that's actually able to speak. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to take this time to ask you a question. You have 30 years of programming and development experience at least. And, and he's only like 35 years old. This is pretty amazing here. Um you as a developer, what was it like when you first 
found Bitcoin and saw this problem being solved of a decentralized ledger system. Did this rock your world or what was this like? Uh, well, I'm, this is embarrassing because when I first learned about Bitcoin, I accepted the article's explanation of how it worked. And the journalists um, haven't got a clue. And so I just thought, oh, there's no way this works. There's, there's, the numbers don't work. The data structures don't work. It's, it's too fluffy. There's no way. And, and so I really, really didn't pay too much attention to it for like about a year, um, most of 2010. And then in 2011, I, I bought in uh, just on a whim. Uh, Bitcoin was going through it, one of its first bubbles up to $30. And, and I bought in on the upside at 70 some odd cents. And, and what's really crazy about 70 cents is that it's one of those prices it never visits again. It just zooms right through the price. And so a uh, very unique purchase. And, um, and then I didn't really pay attention to it again because I, I still hadn't read the white paper. I still hadn't uh, looked at the technology closer. And then I started looking at it in 2013. And that's when I went, oh, my gosh, what have I been doing for two years? Why did I not pay attention? And, um, and then I started, uh, I did the Texas Bitcoin Conference, and I did a bunch of uh, mini conferences in Austin where I got, met Jason King and other people like that. And, uh, and I got more and more and more involved in the space. And then uh, uh, there were David Johnston in particular really, really, really wanted me to do a project. And so he pestered me and pestered me and I finally decided to do something and I uh, kicked it around for a couple months and then I finally decided the thing I needed to do was this little simple two or three month project <laughs> and I had visions of a, a building just essentially a nice centralized system and not and, and nothing but uh, it grew into a decentralized autonomous uh, protocol like Factum and, and it turns out that that's several orders of magnitude harder and we are uh still in the middle of development but is it more difficult than tying a bow tie oh no no tying bow ties are, is easy <laughs> i can tie a bow tie um so paul what advice would you give to young programmers uh people that are very logically based and who you know can make sense of stuff like bitcoin and are interested in joining the bitcoin space or you know, giving some of their talent, time and talents to, to helping us move this revolution forward in money uh, and communication. Like what, what would you, what, what advice would you give? I'm not entirely sure what advice to give. Uh, I think that learning as much as you can and finding what it is that is really interesting. I, I think for the, the advice to any young person is the same, whether they're uh, technically inclined or, or, or anything else. Find what it is that you um, really enjoy doing. Uh, make sure you can make a living doing it. I mean, honestly... I, Don't become a podcaster then. <laughs> you know, well, no, the riches of podcasting are unbelievable. You, you know, what's really amazing is how these guys just have three Rolex, Rolexes on each hand and just flaunting it about because they have all those riches from podcasts. Diamonds in my teeth. I mean, yeah, exactly. Private jet is waiting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's a private jet. It can wait. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, you find find it what it is that you really, really want to do, and 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 do it. Throw yourself into it. Um, realize that when you're young, the anything you do to invest in yourself. As a young person, you get to reap the benefits for the rest of your life. So it's a time to have fun, yes, but it's also a time to really, really think hard about who you are and what, what, what it means to be you and how you want to live your life and, and, and live according to your principles. Uh, live deliberately is one of the terms. Paul Snow, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Well, thanks for uh, allowing me to come on the show, and and you know, and I, 
I know I'm a tech guy, and I know uh, that makes it difficult for us to talk. But I'll, I'll I'm, I'm trying. I'm learning my lessons. Yeah, I'll give you one of these, uh, one of these Rolexes in your sh- in your in your swag bag. <laughs> and Paul, any ways that our users can contact you? Uh, yes, you can contact me at paul at factum dot org, and uh, you can generally speaking find contact information for me on uh, Reddit as Paul Snow or uh, bitcointalk.org uh, as Alan X. Alan's my middle name. I, one of the funny things is I occasionally have people tell me that I look like Bill Gates. Yeah, I, I see that. yeah but my name's actually Paul Allen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it's just there, you know. What can I say? All right, guys. Cool. Thank Thanks. You. All right. Thanks again for listening and hope to see you back next week for another episode of Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast.